Um, so uh, the seven deadly diseases of DevOps. Um, I'm going to go through like the, the deadliest disease of all is the seventh, uh, which is basically security and compliance theater. But I'm going to drill into that of how I kind of think about um, what I do. Um, I am available for parties um, if you want me to play. I really stink, but this was DevOps Days Austin, and we had a great time, and we actually did a kind of a, karaoke, a live karaoke thing. It was pretty cool. So. And I've done a lot of stuff. I won't waste your time. Google me. Um, I, um, the Electric Cloud folk have been um, very gracious to help pay for my kids' college by buying 150 DevOps Handbook. So I'll be signing that at 205 at their booth. And if the uh, book author gods collide properly, there should be a DevSecOps handbook out by the end of the year, which that leads to is Wicket and Ernest Mueller. So there. Um, a while back, I, I was in Australia, and um, I saw a presentation that was showing that um, this kind of what, um, what the world is. And it said, from here to here is Agile. And from here to here was DevOps. And from here to here was SRE. And I thought, oh my God, the end of times are here, right? Like, if that, like, in the early days of DevOps, there was this concern that if, if we, a large crowd comes in, will people start, like, kind of defining it in a way that suits their needs? And the answer is, of course, they will. Um, but as you watch it evolve and you start thinking, okay, really, is that where we're at? Is, is DevOps, like, one of the things you'll hear if you go to serverless, you'll hear a lot of conversation about serverless versus DevOps. And, and the thing is that um, I think my opinion, for what it's worth, is then you got it wrong. Because uh, DevOps is about, um, and I'll just read it to you without the slide, um, that DevOps is, to me, is about a set of patterns and practices that turn human capital into high performance organizational capital. It inherits from lean and agile and all these things and whether your SRE is an implementation of this, or your serverless, or VMware, um, who cares? How you get people to collaborate and work together in a, in a way that creates high performance human, ca human or capital into human organization is what DevOps is about. And so the other slide that you, I'll read to you that you can't see right now is you can't lean agile safe or DevOps your way around a bad organizational culture. But you have to get those things right first. And in fact, um, two years ago, about 18 months ago, I left Docker. I was at working for a developer. Hey! Um, and I thought, I had all these kind of tools in mind, and you know, the DevOps handbook, and, and I work with a lot of um, people who would be considered high-performing organizations, Courtney Kisser over at Nike, Jason Cox over at Disney, I can go on and on. I'm like, I'm gonna take all the greatest things and I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna be a, an amazing consultant. And what I found is, I, st I started decoupling uh, the, the, the words, the technology. I, I, I didn't get that far when we were starting with some name, because if I said DevOps, somebody else in the room said safe. If I said safe, somebody else would say, you know. And, and I realized there are, there's this kind of level zero conversation that should start. And I still think all those tools, lean value stream mapping and things that we talk about in the DevOps handbook, and if you haven't read Jennifer's book, Effective DevOps, you should certainly buy it. Um, like, those are great things to do. Um, but, these but we're very prescriptive without really learning enough. And so what I found was, each time I've engaged with these people, every time I used a, a, a fancy word that they didn't understand, they either felt they didn't understand it and wanted to act like they weren't dumb about it, or they got, I don't think this DevOps thing works. So I got to a place where, when I went, literally, I just start going into organizations and just interviewing teams and talking to people. And we're not really allowed to talk about Lean, Agile, Safe, or Six Sigma, or whatever you want to talk about. 
because I just want to figure out how you work. And in fact, I've de-evolved to like, I just use um, basically the, these uh, sticky, not sticky, but the, uh, the notes, the, the flip charts. So I wind up going ahead and just talking to hundreds of people over a couple week period. And here's the other thing. I think lean value stream mapping is a very effective tool, but it's artificial in most organizations because you're pulling a bunch of people from different groups and you're putting them into one place and then you're trying to gather truth. Now you do gather some truth, but you don't get the whole truth. So I want to talk to people in their native habitat. If you're a t development team that's worked together for 10 years or 15 years, I want to talk to you without your manager, without the champion who wants to turn them into a DevOps group for a whole day and just write stuff on flip charts. So basically that's where I came up with this idea. And the one other thing that to, to this point is, um, and I got this from Christina Maslach and I kind of morphed it. Christina Maslach is one of the, is the foremost authority on occupational burnout. And she was using this in the context of burnout, but I think it works really well here. Um, whenever you're talking about a kind of change or improvement where you're counting on a bunch of people even to do it, um, if they haven't been hard a part of it, you're dead on arrival. So the other reason I like this thing, I'd like to say I was a genius and I figured this out up front, but I actually kind of stumbled into this idea of just very low tech, no buzzwords, and if you're not presenting their opinion, the edge, the people who put their fingers on the keyboard, if we're not talking to them, so here's an example. Like, I'm, I'm going to run out of time, but I can't help. I'll, I'll just leave out a lot of good shit. Um, it, here's the thing, right? Like, people say, well, John, it's hard to change. It's like, yeah, you know, I used to think that. Because what we do is we go into an organization or somebody in an organization finds, I want to be DevOps. No, no, I want to be DevOps. So we find the first couple, and they're actually kind of easy. And they were like, this DevOps thing, man. So we've, we've tackled 3% of our organization. And then we go around to the rest of the organization. That's why I have the square peg round hole saying, get on this DevOps thing. And we never talk to them. We've got a confirmation bias that it's the way it has to be. And, you know, example, everything goes in source code. Yeah, but I got a system. I don't want to talk about it. Put it in source code. Yeah, but the system does. No, no, put it in source code. Yeah, but the system doesn't have any source. The source of truth is in the GUI. Oh. Okay, well then, write a script to write out the XML, import it into GitHub, and then, what? So, we make this mistake of not thinking they're resistant, and there are people that are resistant to change. But I think we wholesale say, oh, there's this really good group, and they love it, and the rest of the organization, they don't like us because they don't like change. And there is a small, it's a bell curve, there is a small group of people that are, but there's a bunch of people like, just talk to us. And let us help you understand the change, because we run a 56-year-old COBOL application on a mainframe, and we, you know, and IBM doesn't give us the source code to the systems behind that. So what I found was, as I went through this process, I call it deadly disease because that sounds really cool for presenting, but there's sort of archetypes of patterns that I can categorize these things that I see over and over and over, and in fact. That first week, I do like three development teams, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I do infrastructure, Friday, I do risk and compliance, or whatever you call it. I'll give you examples. I talk, by the time I get to Thursday, I talk to the infrastructure people, I'm like, and I, I play this Columbo, like, I don't know, just help me understand this. You know, and I say, is there any friction with the development teams for resource allocation? No, why do you ask? I'm like, well, I kind of heard that every time the development team from finance wants to request storage or memory, you basically cut it in half. Like, of course we do. They're idiots. Yeah. You don't get that in a value stream mapping exercise. And again, I could go, I don't have the time, I could go over and over and over. But, so the first, I'm not going to go through all of them, I'm going to drill in. But the first one is like the, like the, the bookends, one and seven. Like, like, there's some cool stuff in the middle that we may or may not get to. So when I say measure manual work, what I'm saying is, I start off in this room with, say, a development team on Monday. I draw a box on the flip chart. And they're all like, whoa, is this guy, oh, another consultant gonna make our life better. You know, half of them come in and they're, you know, they want to eat me for, you know, I'm red meat, they're ready to kill me. You know, they want to prove that I'm an idiot. You know, and I'm like, you know, 
I don't like this DevOps thing. I'm like, I don't give a shit. We're not going to talk about DevOps. What do you mean we're not going to talk about it? You wrote the book. I'm like, I'm not talking about DevOps. I said, okay. Calm down, everybody. Draw a box on flip chart. And I go, how does work start? For the next hour, that team is arguing to me that it's not the right question. John, you don't understand. It's way more complicated than this. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know. But like, how does work start? No, but look, vote it on. You have to. Look. And like all these variations of, in their mind, mental models of complexity that it is impossible to answer this crazy, simple question. But I'm persistent. In about an hour, there's usually a breakthrough. Because I'm like, at that point, I'm like, okay, I know it's going to happen. I'm going to get angry. Calm down, John, but you're going to get angry anyway. And I say, all right, it's Monday morning. You open up your laptop. You go to do something. Where did that something come from? If you must know, I'm like, yes, glorious. And then we have this incredible conversation about how work actually happens. Hey, swag, what, what percentage actually do you actually document? How come you tell, tell, explain to me when, oh, that's Sue's group. We don't really keep a record. Why? Because, well, Sue's team, we know they're really good on requirements, and usually it only takes a half an hour. Most people who read the Phoenix Project are like, that half an hour is in your mind. It actually might be 63 hours with downstream dependencies that you don't have no control of. But in your mind, no record of it. So the net net is, I find that half the places I go into, um, capture 50% at best of all the work they do. And I go back to the CIO. How do we do, John? I'm like, not good. And I love this because I don't even talk a lot of them, but they're not used to people like me. They're used to people with suits and all that. I come out with my sneakers. I'm almost tempted to put my sneakers on a desk sometime. I'm not sure yet on that one. Um, and then they say, well, explain yourself, John. Of course, you know. Like, you know, you're CEO of a multi-billion dollar corporation, like you don't take just platitudinal answers. So I'm like, all right, let's start with if you were an airline and built planes, I would fly on it. John, you need to explain that deeper. Okay, let me get to the, you're a billion dollar IT budget and half of what goes on in your infrastructure is not documented. Try that in finance. <laughs> hey, the accountants every other month are gonna aggregate what they think the ledger would be. And you'd be out of business. But in some ways, we tolerate this. And people laugh, yeah, 50% if you're lucky. Imagine this, again, we, we think that we got the science and we're really good at this stuff. And almost every large cap company that I've been to in the last two years, it's somewhere between 30 and 60% of uncaptured work. A billion dollar budget. I mean, I don't know. Like, maybe you guys think that's all OK. That freaks me out. And then, you know, John Osborne has this thing, and he, he's been really, you know, on incident from an and Stellar report and all this stuff. But I thought, like, he has this notion of dark debt, right? And he uses it more for incident. But I think it plays really well, like, this concept of unforeseen independencies, invisible uh, to anomalies. If you're only capturing half your work, every bullet, every line in that bullet, like, will totally applies to not just incident, but everything downstream dependencies. Vulnerabilities that are not caught. I mean, we go on and on and on and on. We have no idea. We're on the dark side of the moon. We don't know if the 80% value is in the 50% we're not capturing. Right, so the Phoenix Project has a great story about that, that like, oh, we got Sue's group, it only takes a half an hour. And then uh, Gene does a really good, Kevin Bear is here as well, um, of explaining kind of a very, your know, mom could understand Little's Law of how that could actually be 63 hours, or 63 days, actually. So I'll let you read the Phoenix Project for that. Um, the other thing, I, the second deadly disease is really kind of coupled well with the first, which is I find most companies have, on average, 10 different systems for the 50% they do capture. SharePoint, Jira, Remedy, Remedy Request for Service, Remedy some doctored up version of Request for Service, um, in-house built system. And by the way, let's see people shake their head. Like, this is the beauty part. Like, every time I say this, everybody's like, that's us? And some people are like, how'd you get in our building, you know? Um, you're all the same. Um, unless you're not, then come talk to me. But, um, but you have all these systems. And by the way, they all have different context of why they are there. So, so you, like, you're, 
first off, you have this whole blanket way of confusing the shit out of everybody in your company. And you've already created tentacles that make it impossible for you to actually get visible work to understand what the hell you're doing in a billion plus IT budget. Ah, this one didn't go. Oh, yeah, it did. So, oh, yeah, the systems. And then, guess, you know, what is the most favorite of all? Anybody want to call it out? Way of work happens in, in large enterprise workplaces? Oh, no, oh, no. Oh. The cubicle. Hey, Bob, you do this? Yeah, sure, no problem. Or on the way to the elevator. Good. I mean, if it works, it works. Um, you know, so you get into, like, again, I'll make this all online. I'm trying to keep, keep on time. Uh, you know, it's just like these things are just going to perpetuate toil and, and that dark debt concept. The only thing I want to say, there's a really good, um, I, every year I go to Portland for three days. Gene, uh, Kim, Peter Fodor invites about 40 or 50 of us to do these work study things. And I've been privileged to be involved in that for like five or six years. And the goal is to try to create like a white paper. And last year, one of the papers is called Overcoming Efficiency Work Matter. It's basically this problem. And one of the things that's interesting about it is, it has kind of countermeasures, but ultimately the one that I suggest and use, which they are the ones that define it, is sort of a stranglehold pattern. So I don't want to tell everybody in an organization, get rid of SharePoint, get rid of Jira, do, you, do this. I do want to start guiding you in a certain direction. So this stranglehold pattern is a way to say, okay, I'm going to have, I'm going to put it like a system that drives me. If Jira is the way that you want to start defining work, then let's kind of try to drive all the things into it even if you're not ready to be there yet. This is another interesting point. We tend to think DevOps transformations are linear. Team one, team two, team three. They should all go in the same direction, and they should all go at the same rel relative speed. But that other 90% that we don't talk to, they might be able to do this, this, or this. And by the way, their cadence of getting there is going to be maybe five years versus five months. And so I think we don't think enough about how we think about the different things. And I'll tell a story that, like SpaceX, right? The first time I, I have a friend that works at SpaceX, this admin, it was, it was about four years ago, I got a, um, a tour, and he was explaining why they put windows on, on the um, rocket ships that where no human was gonna probably be in it for 10 years. The answer was they know that a human will be in it, why not get used to it and testing and learn how it. So this is another model of, even if a development team that is mainframe and COBOL based, but has some integration with, with um, you, know, uh, you know, cell phone, no, not cell phones, <laughs> I'm an idiot, um, just um, digital platforms, like put the windows in now. Like don't worry about when they get there, start driving the things that you can do to make them better. And, and so this is a really good pattern. Um, this one is really interesting, um, but uh, I've got a video online, so if you follow me, where I go into it, uh, I just want to say that this notion of inventory in the cloud native world freaks me out. <laughs> and and pre-cloud native, it freaked me out somewhat. Like the notion of, of service levels or service management and, and the CMDB, pre-cloud native, if I can use that word, oh, words, um, I think it was like, like not good. Now when we're like, you know, Tobo Powell at Capital One says, you know, three years ago he worried about like a stack of 400 applications, 500 applications. So now he worries about 50,000 applications with microservices. So there are so many things going on that the separation, really, five minutes, God. I actually had 10 from the time I started, but you know, give, you know, I started at, um, at all right, because I started at, nine, uh, at 10, I don't know, all right. Um, yeah, it's frustrating, all the video stuff, but, um, all right, there's, like, there's a lot going on here that, like, your organization and parts of uh, things are happening. And I'm not anti-CMD, I'm not anti idle and I'm not anti, you know, service management. I'm just saying there has to be a global rethink because the two worlds are, are separating at a pace that can't even understand each other. Who owns a service in a microservices architecture? Um, 
what there's this notion now coming up what's called the deployment mesh. Look, th look it up. Like there's a lot of new artifacts that we're not even thinking about in the classic DevOps CI CD scenario. How many people pen test their API structure? I usually get one or two out of a room. I have a customer who went to SmartBear and said, could you create us this with Swagger? And they said no. Right? Like, so you have all this Swagger doc, and you're not even treating it as a first class citizen that you could do some type of CI integration testing, as opposed to finding out in the field and paying some, some pen testers to come in to find out that you know, company X slash this slash user slash get ID is wide open. Um, this is an example. Um, Redefine this project for this one, um, which is basically uh, institutional versus tribal knowledge. Incongruent design. Um, I think the notion of like if you're not tracking this, so organizations are trying to move from I shape to T shape. Um, people who talk about E shapes are probably a little more forward thinking. I shape is I'm the Oracle DBA. Uh, T shape might be I do all things databases, plus I write some scripts and code. E shape means I'm kind of doing everything. I'm in a team where I have to basically absorb all the knowledge, network, security. Um, and so um, there's a notion of Conway's law, I'm going to skip it in Equifax, which would be awesome. Read the Congress report on Equifax and look up Conway's law, and like, it will show you the be most beautiful example of Conway's law in play. The, the CISO reports the chief legal officer. That's the dialogue. Ultimately, what I want you to get to is build run teams. Um, you know, and that, that's why I want you all to start creating development mindset. If Jira is your weapon of choice, tickets flow. That team may not be there for three years, but we're starting, we're putting the windows in the rocket ships today. Uh, managing complexity, blameless. Um, you can probably hear this from a million other people that do it really well. You know, blameless thinking. And finally, just the last one, uh, which is the um, security compliance theater, right? So like, as you're thinking about not captured work and bottlenecks and all this stuff, at the end of the day, what you draw is a picture for the CIO that everything that you do in a yearly audit internally and even externally is bullshit. And it's not a fun conversation because it's completely subjective. It's a lot of people and it's a lot of bypasses. And when you talk to people about, like, what do you really do? Well, I always make it minor impact. Even when you know it's major impact, yep, it's a plus. Because I don't want to get bottled down. I have to get this thing done today. I mean, you find that people are doing incredible workarounds, and all you have at the end of the day is some checklist of a bunch of subjective checkboxes that say that you passed an audit. And Equifax had that, and the last five billion market cap. Marriott is still trying to resolve the four years that somebody was, people were in there, and how, um, like 10 million passports are actually in the wild, including mine. Um, you know, there's the DevSecOps, you know, all things. You just add security into the pipeline. Um, kind of finally, or getting close to finally, um, on my timeline, if we're okay with my timeline, okay, which is 30 minutes from when I started. Um, the other thing I'm really interested in right now, so again, I, I'm, I apologize for going through this fast. It's 30 minutes, it's tough to cover all this. I think the deployments mesh and how we're not thinking about inventory globally. We got one group that's thinking like pure idle and service management. Well, like, here's another example. If you've been tracking SRE, where does SLOs fit in with service management SLAs? Like, they're not connected. They don't even understand each other. One's French and one's German. And they're both valid. Maybe idle version 8 will include um, service mesh, uh, deployment mesh. But then I think the other thing, thing is how I'm, people are starting to, I'm seeing this very, only a couple of banks, where they're trying to change this, what I call subjective attestation to objective attestation. Subjective is, it's a bunch of humans. I'm going to do a change. I put a bunch of doc together. By the way, I gamify the shit out of it to make sure I get, because what's the one goal? Is get the cab to approve. That is the only goal. It's not about how good the change is or how effective the change is. The goal is I need the cab to improve this. So I do everything I can to bucket that up 
to get to some person who tries to understand it. And by the way, that job is impossible today because the horizontalization of the complexity of most systems no human could understand. But they basically, yeah, that's good. Bob, he's usually pretty good. And somebody else is like, not touching my side. Eh, it's Bob, fine. Won't even read the doc. Um, goes in. Somebody comes up, audit, they look and say, let me see this change. Here's the remedy ticket. We're good. What people are doing is saying that's bullshit. What you need to do is put that attestation in the pipeline. And what it does is it replaces that subjectivity of if I say there are 12 things that have to happen for every deployment, I need to have, um, it has to have source code, it has to have um, a, a pairing, it has to have a build, it has to validation, all this. I create crypto events that create basically a list, you know, and I'll, I'll cough blockchain, but it doesn't have to be that exotic, to say an auditor comes in and looks at this hash, and they say, oh, that's a distributed ledger, got it, move on. And by the way, now we're like 80, 90% accuracy in our attestation versus a bunch of humans telling other humans that are about 25 or 30%. Um, anyway, these are the operational tips. And so just to complete everything, like this is the summary slide, like try to capture all work, try to consolidate work systems. Um, you definitely has to be a rethink about legacy and cloud native in terms of inventory, um, remove, you know, redefine this project, remove bottlenecks. Um, inverse Conway's law, I didn't have time to do that, but like look it up. Um, blameless culture for um, complex systems and start thinking about um, uh, uh, objective attestation, automated governance, and I am three minutes to spare, but I'll give it back. Anyway, thank you so much. Um,